Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Frank Martin Seifert. I'm working at the European Space Agency, and I would like to welcome you for the side event on how global and national data sets uh, support national forest monitoring systems for RED. Well, coming from a space agency, uh, you might question what we are doing here at uh, COP. And in fact, we are an uh, intergovernmental observer organization since 2001 and attending COPs since 15 years. We have set up projects in the meantime uh, related to the Kyoto Protocol as well related to RED. There we were doing several pilot cases in uh, mainly African countries, uh, rainforest countries, uh, dry uh, forest countries in the southern part. And uh, we are supporting as well international initiatives like Gofsi Gold, setting up uh, the Red Plus Sourcebook, a well-known scientific reference uh, related to red and uh, red and monitoring. We are also engaged in the Global Forest Observation Initiative, and they are mainly related to uh, satellite data coordination but as well supporting the overall setup of uh, that initiative. And you will hear later on in this side event from even uh, more about GFOI. ESA has since six years set up a uh, climate change initiative where we are uh, generating currently 13 of the 50 ECVs for GCOS and UNFCCC. And uh, coming back now more to the nature of a space agency, we are uh, coordinating the space component of the European uh, uh, flagship program, Copernicus, and they are specifically related to the Sentinel uh, satellites. Sentinel satellites, and those people who heard it, uh, who were staying uh, in the side event before, heard already uh, the remark, what about the Sentinel? They are providing uh, uh, high resolution data uh, down to 10 meters, uh, will you use that? And uh, yes, we are relatively fresh on the market uh, related to uh, to the provision of uh, the data. Uh, since two years, we have the first satellite in orbit, and uh, together with the European Commission, we are uh, uh, we are responsible for uh, the overall uh, uh, for the space segment within the Copernicus program. Copernicus program provides the necessary data for operational monitoring of the environment and as well civil security. And that's not only for Europe, but that's globally. Uh, globally. And now the nice thing for all and everybody, not only here within the room, but everybody on our planet, the data policy is free and open. You can use, download the data and, uh, and use them to observe the uh, territory of your interest. There you see the website where you can download data. So uh, the Sentinels are uh, uh, six families of satellites, and uh, we have launched the first four. Uh, two radar satellites, one optical uh, high-resolution satellite, the medium-resolution satellite, and there are more to come. And if you want to know more specifically about the, uh, uh, the Sentinel data, there's a side event tomorrow at the EU Pavillon in room Bratislava uh, from uh, half past five to six o'clock. Well, now coming much more to uh, GFOI and the uh, sense of the side event today. And uh, there I would like to uh, raise attention to the memoriam of Jim Penman. Jim Penman was working at the University College in London and for the Environment Institute. He was the EU lead in the international climate negotiations for many, many years. He is known expert on uh, LULUC forestry treatment under the UNFCCC and had a major role in establishing and develop RED+. Plus. Within GFOI, he was a spiritual mentor of GFOI, where he was really instrumental in the publication of the GFOI method and guidance document for Red Plus activities. And what you see next to uh, the image of uh, Jim Penman is the second version of the method and guidance document just released 
uh, last week. Jim anchored us from the remote sensing community in this policy needs uh, for the governments and for UNFCCC. He brought us often back to track and say, and what can we get out of it? Don't, don't fuzz around with, uh, with very sophisticated scientific topic. Come to, uh, come to the beef. So we all will miss his dry and sharp sense of humor, his knowledge, and I would like to give a short moment of silence in the mem memory of Jim Penman. Now coming to our agenda of the today's side event. We will have a keynote from René Castro. Uh, he is uh, the Assistant Director General of FAO, responsible for forestry. He's currently in another side event and uh, might just drop in later on. So I think we will start with you, Evan, and uh, uh, inform us about uh, overall uh, GFOI uh, and how GFOI is supporting countries. Please, Evan. Great, thanks. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. Nice to see you all here. Um, so I guess you can let me know if, if uh, Rene Castro shows up and yeah. he's got limited time, we can take a little break and, and come back. Um, so uh, I'm Evan Notman with uh, the US Agency for International Development. Uh, the, the US is, is one of the uh, lead uh, partner organizations to GFOI and I'm uh, uh, one of the, the leads uh, on the team. And, and so uh, as being the representative uh, here at the COP, uh, I have been asked to provide a little bit of, of background about what uh, GFOI is uh, and what we're doing and, and what we would like uh, to continue to do on into the, into the future um, to, to frame some of the, the discussion uh, that will we'll follow about uh, working with countries and, and global data sets. I am just uh, delaying a minute here while the slides get uh, loaded. But my first slide is really a picture, uh, and it is a, a picture of a whole lot of people standing in front of uh, something. It's one of the GFOI open forums, you know, a picture of uh, lots of people who had been at a meeting just to kind of show um, what GFOI is. And, and GFOI really, the, the idea behind it is it's a network of, uh, of countries and partners working together uh, to help um, provide coordinated support for forest monitoring systems. Um, and there is a focus in that support to, to help uh, forest monitoring systems for, for uh, red plus and red plus reporting. But just as importantly, it's also about providing support for forest monitoring systems that will allow countries to have data and information for, for management of forests and lands. Um, one of the uh, strengths of, of GFOI is it really is a, uh, a set of different partners from from countries representing uh, uh, work from, from development agencies, from technical agencies, uh, and uh, from universities, as well as uh, other, other partners that we interact with. Um, there we go, great. <laughs> uh, and then this moves it forward. All right, as, as I, as I said, there is a picture of a, a whole lot of people standing in uh, front of something if, uh, as a as a meeting. Um, so, so why is why is uh, GFOI useful? What what is the, the gap that we feel that it uh, it is uh, filling? Uh, well, I think there's a, a, a clear realization that um, forest monitoring is complex. It's a uh, rapidly uh, evolving area where technology is constantly improving uh, our ability to do work, but also uh, creates uh, challenges to, to keep up with that technology. Uh, at the same time, uh, 
the countries that are in the process of developing their, their forest monitoring systems uh, are looking for, for support and guidance and information. Um, through GFY, we're, we're, we're able to provide a work together to identify kind of what are some uh, shared uh, guidance methods and approaches uh, to providing that support and then coordinating that support. Um, and given the complexity of the number of countries uh, looking for support and the number of different countries uh, helping to provide, as well as with other organi organizations to provide that support, it really is important to think about how we can best coordinate uh, our efforts. Um, and that was really the, the foundation of support, uh, the, the foundation of the idea um, that came uh, from when the key lead uh, partner countries of uh, the U.S., Norway, and, and uh, Australia uh, to, to achieve those goals. Uh, the GFOI was, uh, was founded uh, under the group of Earth Observations, the GEO, in 2011. Uh, with the first work plan uh, that went to 2013 and has been going since. Uh, the lead partners, as I mentioned, were Australia, Norway, and USA, but also working uh, very closely uh, with FAO and, and CIOS. Um, we've also worked to ensure that we're also integrating other partners, such as UNFC, uh, IPCC, World Bank, FCPF, uh, multiple universities, and, and others. Um, we are also uh, always open to, to including new partners and, and creating new interactions. Uh, so uh, how is GFOI structured? Um, it's uh, essentially uh, has four uh, key work streams, and those are capacity building, methods and guidance, space data coordination, and research and development coordination. Um, I'm going to just quickly run through some key points of what each of these do and, and uh, provide some information on that. And, and then we'll talk a little bit about where we're going and, and hand it over. So uh, under capacity building, this is really the, the core goal of what uh, GFOI is trying to do is to provide uh, improved capacity building to countries who, who wish to improve forest monitoring systems. Um, and it is uh, working to uh, uh, bring together the various organizations doing it. Under GFOI, the two kind of major uh, efforts are work of, of Silver Carbon, which is a program of uh, the US government, which is bringing together the key technical agencies uh, that do work on uh, uh, land use and forest uh, monitoring, all to help provide capacity building, and then work uh, under uh, UN Red and FAO. Um, the idea is to use uh, the uh, key information that is being developed under the methods and guidance as a way to uh, understand and uh, uh, organize how we provide capacity building in a in a in a clear way, um, and. Uh, also identify what are some new tools and, and areas needed for capacity building. Um, and that's got uh, management, kind of we've got individual managers that work uh, on that, that we interact with. Uh, secondly, the methods and guidance document documentation uh, uh, group is, is really uh, been, uh, the goal has been to provide uh, clear and consistent uh, uh, guidelines for GFOI partners and capacity building uh, activities so that we, you know, we come together and, and work to develop these uh, shared guidance documents uh, to help uh, countries have clarity on, on you know, what are some uh, broad approaches, but allowing a lot of flexibility, uh, but, but helping to provide information on what can be used uh, that, that us as, as multiple um, workers on capacity building are all sharing and, and using the same information. Um, and it's, it's also worked to improve the accessibility of, of, of technical data and, and linking to uh, the IPC good practice guidance. Uh, the first version of the uh, uh, methods and guidance document was published in January 2014. And then the second version was just published in, in August in 2016. And that is actually uh, accessible through a web-based application, which is the Red Compass, uh, available at that, that website. Um, and the goal of that is to actually have a, 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 an approach in which you can uh, provide uh, 
get step-by-step -step access and understand uh, the information uh, in, a, in a clear, organized way. Uh, the next group is the space data, data coordination. Uh, this has helped to coordinate civil space agencies to influence satellite acquisition um, and ensure, aims to ensure coverage uh, for and continuity for countries looking to have improved data for, do, for doing this work. Um, there's also, uh, as with the, all of the groups, we've worked, looked, we are working to make sure that there's interface between one group and the next. So for instance, understanding uh, where space data provision can link to work on research and understanding how to better use uh, uh, research, for instance. Um, and that work is led by the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites or SEALs. Um, and then uh, finally, there's the R&D coordination group. Uh, and the, the goal of this group is, is to identify and coordinate global R&D activities for forest monitoring um, that will help meet country needs. So understand where we can work to, per, to in, improve uh, the, the methodology uh, for forest monitoring and connect that eventually with uh, capacity building. Um, it's really prioritized uh, remote sensing areas, uh, but also looking to, to connect uh, to for, uh, national forest monitoring systems. Um, some of the priorities of work to date have been focusing on forest degradation, mapping of forest types, interoperability of systems, uh, and uh, in increasing ability to uh, uh, tools for measuring uncertainty. Uh, and then, so uh, this is just a reminder kind of to say in sum, the idea is to connect, is to have these uh, four unique work streams with different uh, parts of, of the GFOI partners leading those, but making sure that we are looking at, at ensuring that there's uh, interaction and connection between these work streams. So in uh, uh, this year, in 2016, uh, the GFOI partners actually commissioned a re review of what GFOI has done to date, um, looking to understand, well, as we move forward, what are some of the things that, that you know, how, how has GFOI worked well? Where are some of the areas that maybe could be improved? Um, and thinking about how we can move forward. That review is now complete and will soon be online I believe for, for uh, viewing at uh, the GFOI website. And basically uh, the finding was that GFOI has provided really useful information, has helped capacity building, but there are areas that there, there can be improvement too. Um, and one of the, one of the areas that, that was highlighted was really thinking about how we can expand and increase the partnership of GFOI, bring in uh, other partners and better integrate uh, the countries that we're working in. And then, so that's an area that we're particularly interested in working in and very interested to hear from others in the room who might be interested in figuring out how to interact with us. Uh, so uh, we are currently uh, developing a uh, GFOI phase two. The, the current lead partners are all supportive of continuing uh, this work. Um, uh, we are looking to really focus on uh, providing this goal of coordinated capacity building on forest monitorings and help uh, specifically uh, working with, with countries to identify their particular needs. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the, the key goals is, is understanding how to uh, further increase the way we interact with additional partners and additional activities. Um, one of, uh, you know, part of the, the, the goal of, of this introduction was also to, to kind of highlight ways in which the GFOI um, um, uh, partnership can link to efforts such as uh, understanding how to use uh, global data sets. And so, for instance, some of that work has taken place in terms of understanding uh, how you talk about the inclusion of global sets in uh, the methods and guidance documents. Some of that work is undertaken under looking at how to uh, uh, improve the interaction with global data sets, with national data sets in the, in the research components. And then some of it is, is looked at kind of having consistent ways to talk about it in capacity building activities. So as we uh, continue on with the rest of the talk today, I think we'll hopefully highlight on those points. And with that, I would like to uh, hand it over. Thank you.
Thank you, Evan. I think we're moving now uh, directly to uh, Martin Herold. Good afternoon. My name is Martin Herold. I'm from uh, Wageningen University. <clears throat> I'm also here in the capacity of, uh, of a co-lead of the R&D coordination component of the Global Forest Observation Initiative that's just presented and that is basically coordinated by the Gothsi Gold Land Cover Office uh, uh, that is supported by the European Space Agent Agency and we appreciate that support very much. I'm going to talk a bit more technical because this is coming, that's work that's related to the uh, research and development coordination component and and our way of thinking on how some of these global data sets can actually be used or perhaps should not be used for the purpose of national level uh, monitoring reporting and imp implementation and um, I mean these global data sets and with the opportunities that we have at hand for example there is a sentinel satellite we have the Landsat archive we have a whole bunch of these free and open data sources, producing these global data sets is becoming more feasible. And we have seen a lot of progress in that. And an example is, for example, many of you may know the Matt Hansen based tree cover gains and loss data that is widely available through the Global Forest Watch. And uh, some people might have a look at that, uh, might have had a look, a look at that. Um, um, that's that's one, one, ex, one example. Um, the other one is uh, a, a case where uh, we then started to look at, you know, large area sampling surveys um, and, uh, for example, the, the FAO, so the Forest uh, Resources Assessment in the past did um, a remote sensing survey uh, up to 2005 and that remote sensing survey, and I think we can move forward a couple slides, uh, uh, I can do that in fact, um, so that's the, the Matt Hansen data. Um, that is the what I was mentioning, the sample-based survey on the land use that's following de deforestation. So basically what you see is the, the bubble, the size of the bubble is the amount of de deforestation. The color is the land use that's following the, the clearing. So this is a more an analysis of, of the more related to the drivers of deforestation. And that is that is work that has been done. This is a pantropical survey, but if the sampling density is is detailed enough, so for bigger countries, you might actually use that for national estimation. You can make, make, get better statistics on, 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 on basically what is the land use change related to deforestation. So that's, a, that's another example. And of course, we have the whole realm of activities related to biomass mapping. And uh, we have seen there's a quite some proliferation of various products. The point I'd like to make here that these space-based biomass estimations are now increasingly underpinned by an, a large amount of biomass plot data that has been made available and so we are, we will be in a situation that the the kind of biases the kind of uncertainties that we have in these biomass estimations will be reduced uh, and uh, and will be reduced or can be re reduced by using more ground data to do that so that's an active process uh, there are quite some prospects there are several satellite missions in fact that are planned to only map forest biomass for the whole whole globe, so a lot of prospect basically on these kind of uh, kind of things. So there's a lot of development. But then the question is then, in the context of the Paris Agreement, what, what can be the use of these kind of things? Right? So first of all, let's recap a bit. Out of Paris, we have you know we have Article Five, so we have Red Plus as, as being part of it. We have the forest sinks as being part of it. We also have Article Two, which says that any efforts should not harm food production. So this intr intrinsic uh, <clears throat> let's say uh, potential synergies and trade-offs between the agricultural sector and the, and, the, and the livestock sector and we've just learned about the drivers of deforestation which is basically knowing the deforestation solution is in the agricultural sector uh, more than in the forest sector um, that that basic issue is is on the table when we're thinking about implementing Paris. We have also this uh, demand coming from the climate science uh, that basically says if you want to achieve 1.5 or 2 degrees, we do need sinks, right? And, uh, or they call it negative emissions. Uh, the only carbon and capture storage technology that has worked is forests and soils. So there is this kind of expectation that the land use sector will be able to deliver some of these things. And that's, a, that's an important new, th new thing that, that we have on the agenda. The other thing is, of course, Paris is very much this bottom up process. So, so kind of everyone should do something. So it's not only about countries, it's about private sector, NGOs, uh, about cities and, and regions to take responsibility. And one of the key things to stimulate these activities, because that's what we want, 
is to keep accountability and that's where transparency comes in and that's that's why transparency is such a big big issue now in the discussions also here in in mara so the monitoring issues out of of the Paris Agreement is besides the regular stock taking by countries and, and the NDC process is of course the whole issue of trans transparency and the issue related to that on so how can we use data to actually stimulate and implement these activities the land use activities that's supposed to reduce the sources and and, and enhance this the sinks and so coming back to this notion of global data sets versus national reporting that is one of the things that we'll see more often because the the basically the scope of monitoring has increased quite a bit now with the Paris Agreement in place and those are the three things there so if you think about that the Paris Agreement requirements, we have this regular stock taking, we have transparency, and we have the implementation challenges. Uh, I'd like to then focus my presentation on four main challenges. The first one is actually improving national greenhouse gas reporting. And we have been working as part of the GFOI, the, uh, as part of GovC Gold, and many partners have invested quite some effort to help improve national capacities of countries. And we see that in the last forest resources assessment of the FRA, the country capacities to report on forest area change has improved significantly compared to the last ones, largely driven by satellite availability of satellite remote sensing, but also the inventory capacities of countries has, has improved to reach the positive effect. Countries are in a better situation now than they were five years ago on, 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 on reporting on their forests. And uh, <clears throat> just want to showcase one example as part of this GFOI. We've been supporting that. There's the guidance documents. We have developed training modules on top of these guidance docu documents. We have done a series of um, uh, workshops where we actually bring together the various agencies that work on capacity development. So not only GFOI, but also UN Red, the FCPF, so the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility, the various partners to deliver a bit of a, a joint capacity development efforts. There'll be a couple of these workshops that have been done over the course of uh, this year and there's one more planned in Francophone Africa which will be in February uh, next next year and then of course we have the the research and development component with the main objectives actually so how can we take what's been developed in research and make that and translate that into something useful for the countries and that's actually not that easy and it has to be very targeted and very focused and so in the in the issue of global the use of global data for national monitoring, we have, we did have several expert workshop, workshops that actually discussed that, that, that issue. And basically there are several ways on one could thought about that. And that's well docu documented. I put the sources, sources here. So the experts have been sitting together because they understood that this is an important notion that we have to develop more guidance, more guidance on. So basically what are the motivations of countries to actually use them? So first of all, in case a country does not have any reliable or official map data, I don't think there is a lot of these cases. Countries usually start with something. Uh, I'm not much aware of any of that. You can use the data as kind of a cross-check. So you take the data, you compare it, you can compare estimates, you maybe compare maps or whatever, and to get a bit of an idea of, do I have potential consistencies, inconsistencies, do I have potential errors in the data that I, I have? So more, more like as an independent check, and you can basically take that data off the shelf. You can use the global data potentially in, in, a, in initial stratification to develop your activi activities. And there are examples where people have used some of the, for example, the Manhattan based SD, uh, maps and use them to throw the sample that they need to basically estimate the area change based on their own interpretations of, of for example, high, high resolution data or use their own kind of mapping. Right? And that's been, that's been uh, done in a few, few cases. And of course, there are ways to integrate maybe the data very directly into, uh, into the monitoring, into potentially even IPCC compliant estimation to increase precision or to reduce costs. Uh, but this comes with investments. There is, there is, it's often, and that's related from an IPC perspective, very much to the uncertainties and the biases that you have on these global data for national use. You cannot just take them off the shelf. You need to assess the data. You have to invest in additional national data to actually is reduce and assess bias and uncertainty as much as possible. And there have been examples on how that has been done, and I think we'll hear more about that from the country presentations we have later, later, later today. This is about the national reporting. Of course, the use of global data sets also important. That's the second challenge is, so what about the technical assessments and, and these kind of review processes where, where which are supposed to be organized by the UNFCCC? That may be an important use of these global 
data sets. And that is an area where I think we have not understood a lot yet on how this is, can be done and what, as a technical community, we should actually do to, to potentially assist that process. Because this is just about to, to start. And that very much relates also to the tra transparency debate and so on. And I am, uh, we have to be very thankful for the people on the UNFC roster of experts to take the time to uh, assess all these reference levels and assess all these inventories and these things come up. But just seeing on what's on the horizon in terms of assessments that need to be done, I think we have a very big gap here. And that's something that I'd just like to point out. The third challenge is, is then actually, so what about starting to implementation? And so what are potential land use sector mitigation options? If you want to do something, you need to start so what to do where. And uh, maybe not so much on the country level, but maybe on the mitigation planning on a larger level. I'll just show one example on where a lot of the various land use emission data sets have been put together to create a kind of a, a map of, you could think about the hotspots of emissions in the land use sector. So red is em, 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 emissions, blue is uh, sinks. And what you see is each of these have an, an, an estimation of net, net emissions, but you also have the sources of these emissions. So are they forest related, forest, deforestation related, forest degradation related, are they related to livestock, are they related to rice, are they related to the various processes that you have in the land use sector. And so if you start to think about this kind of land scale scale, op land scale, scale options or this kind of where, where, are my, where are my potential mitigation hotspots to do so mitigation activities, these kind of analysis can actually be a quite, a quite useful. And as, as, as basically all of the global data sets that I'm showing you, they tend to be uh, at least underpinned by a scientific publication and the data are usually freely available. In fact, if they're not freely ava available, then they're basically not very, not useful at all, I would, I would almost, almost say. And that leads me to my last point, uh, is the challenge, which is actually on how do you actually support the implementation? And that is a very big field. So all of the kind of supply chain monitoring, the support of local activities, the community-based monitoring, who people who were here in the previous side, side event have seen an example on how it can be used as an empowerment tool by communities, uh, some of the data. That is very much in trying to get engagement and trying to support uh, implementation and tracking the progress of these activities, often on a, on a, on a, on a very local level. And I'm just going to pick out of this sphere of potential uh, things that can be done here. I'm going to just pick an example of the using the Sentinel data. That's the ESA Sentinel data. And that's on this issue of uh, actually when, once you have free and open data and once you have observations from two radar satellites that are actually flying. And the advantage of radar sa satellites are that you have no problems with clouds. So you actually, for near real time monitoring, you have an observation every week or every other, other, other week to track activity. So what you actually see here is a, a very dense time series that will tell you on each of the, basically on each place on the planet, what's actually happening to that land in terms of an actual time series. And so for example, you start to not only get observations on where things are changing on an annual level, this is, this is basically bi-weekly obs observations. This is a lot of data that is not an easy uptake but the data are free and openly available. So there's a lot of potential to do something with this kind of, uh, kind of data. The point is, how can you actually make this data useful? But what is it providing is a time series. It gives you something that something is maybe normal, maybe abnormal. It may be able to detect some things. But to really actually put these uh, data into value, you would have to try to link it to the local level. You have to try to use that as a tool and, and, and use this as a kind of a way to create an environment of open exchange and information and to improve transparency so it can actually help the stakeholders on the ground to try to at least have the information, have them openly available so that you can actually uh, have them empowered and have at least some level of accountability of some of the things on, ongoing. And that, there's actually two examples where this has been demonstrated and we're working with the silver carbon program on that, for example, in Peru, where actually this is not just not starting to be a local activity, but that's actually starting to be linked to national level implementation activities, to incentive systems and so on on the, on the national level. So I'd like to point that out. That's not necessarily a global data set to use, but keep in mind these satellite observations are global assets, so the observations the free and open availability of them are part of global global assets and making them useful for local level cir cir circumstances is one of the key objectives here. So to wrap, to wrap up, there's all these new monitoring challenges out of the Paris Agreement. Um, there is usefulness in these global data sets just for consistency checks, 
that may be for the countries, that may be in the assessments, to use a national level estimation. But keep in mind, the data sets cannot be used off the shelf. There needs to be an initial investments in data and capacities. And of course, ownership. I didn't mention that yet. An own, own, own ownership if that integration is to be, 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 be done. And of course, there's this whole opportunities related to actual information sharing and transparency and stakeholder engagement. I think that's a very important di dimension where we start to see, let's say, technical solutions that are being ready to actually be scaled, scaled, scaled up. And that's where we actually see the role also of the Global Forest Observation Initiative and Gulf Sea Gold in the research and development component to continue to provide this guidance, try to be a mediator between the technological pro pro progress that's being done. And I made the point earlier, there's quite some developments done. I mean, some people call it the golden age of Earth observation uh, that we actually have in front of us and, and actually how that can be linked to countries. And my last slide, my last two slides is basically, of course, global data sets have a right on their own. And I'll just give you an example. I showed you the expansion of the FAO forest uh, resource assessment remote sensing survey to include the land use change after deforestation. And these data sets, of course, are an important input to, for example, the state of the world's forest that was just released a few weeks ago, which had the topic of forest and agriculture and land use challenges. That was the topic there. And of course, global and uh, or pantropical assessments like that are an important input to these, to these things. So not only about the national level. And then, of course, I'd like to point out there's an info brief if people are interested on, on enhancing transparency and looking at independent monitoring approaches, which is very much related to here. If you're interested, there's a link there, and there's also a side event tomorrow at the Mediterranean Rooms, somewhere here, uh, if you'd uh, like to hear a bit more about that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And uh, while well, you were closing with uh, a reference to the FAO FRA, and that is a perfect uh, invitation to René Castro, the FAO Assistant uh, Direct, uh, Director General uh, related to uh, forestry. And I would like uh, to invite René uh, to give his uh, keynote speech uh, right now. Thank you a lot, René, for making Thank it you. uh, you're available, uh, attending our side event. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I came a bit late. I was in the oceans, UN oceans next to here, probably because when I was a student in doing my PhD, I learned that fish grow on trees. And when they told me that, you know, that was the very first lesson. lesson. Then they slowly taught us that, yes, you know, you have trees, rivers are better, rivers are better and there is an interaction with the fish. So this is my excuse to be, to, to be late here. And thank you for, for presenting the, the FRA, the Foreign Report Assessment of, of this year. That is the last of its kind. Let me, let me explain that. We have been doing FRA for 70 years, every five years. And we are collecting a large number of data, only reported by the countries. We have 6,000 correspond country correspondents. And unless there is uh, some obvious discrepancy, you know, we receive that and we analyze, systematize, and then it becomes public information. Last year, in 2015, in Paris, the Director General of FAO signed an agreement with Google. Because we thought that some of the experience we have been developing link with some of the Google abilities for remote sensing, for, for satellite images, and adding others, you know, NASA, the European Space Agency, expertise, health, long-term relationship, may help us to do something new. We just presented yesterday, for the first time, the first ever global land use assessment based on 550,000 samples from around the world. 
I said we signed it in Paris and we presented in Morocco. It means less than one year, including all the internal you know, approvals and difficulties and sending the people to the field and, you know, that is not a, a small thing. You can imagine the discussions. When I was minister in my country the first time, 94, 98, I ordered the first, you know, satellite and aircraft used to have a country's forest map or land cover map, forest land cover, it cost us a couple of million dollars and it took us 16 months. They repeated recently just to check with what we have now. It took us nine days. It cost us a few thousand dollars. With the data we collected, we check it with the EU data. And I am happy to inform that we found plus minus 2% uh uncertainty and we did also that with larger countries that i cannot mention without their permission but we compared the data with the recently done by us and the same discrepancies plus minus two percent so we expect from us we will be publishing in nature in national geographic in in remote sensing uh, journals, all this for the international community to discuss if we are, as we think, in a moment of a game-changing situation that may allow us to monitor, in a, you know, to update the information, what, every 10 days? To go back all the way 25 years? to every single satellite map that is available out there and see the changes in the land use. You know, was there a, a natural forest and then a cropland and then a planted forest and now a mole in some areas? And is this a, a really a game changer? Can we provide now the UN Convention on Biological Diversity, the UN Convention in Climate Change, the UN Convention in Di Diversification, with open data that will allow their experts and the experts of the world to analyze what we are, you know, converging now between the FRA and the new uh, updated information coming more often to our uh, I, I, I said our, but in this case to the Google Cloud, because there is a large computing uh, support to this possibility. And finally, when we finished the process, there were a series of countries, Kazakhstan, Papua New Guinea, Mongolia, and I have an, a, a, a lineup of other countries telling us could you train us to use the same collect earth for the national purpose? We did it in Mongolia and it took us one week. And we were shocked about the quality of information that the rangers and the patrols, you know, produce and how quickly they learn to localize the, the threats in the land they, they were guarding. Or, or when we train the people fighting the locusts, the, the desert locusts in, 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 in the Maghreb countries and how quickly they learn how to be before the blooming of the, of the pest or the, of the little uh, destructive capacity that cost these countries millions of dollars and now they can prevent it ex ante now with the people trained locally. So we have trained in, 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 in this same year also around 500 people of those only, you know, interested volunteer and we can still do it. And as I said, we have a, 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 a long request. 
So thank you for inviting me. I came with one question. Is this a game changer? We will be presenting it in every detail, probably in the next International Forest Day in March 2017, with a series of events, one only for experts, another one for users, a third one for policymakers, a fourth one, just to make sure that everyone could ask their questions and make their suggestions. And because after this, it will be available to the whole world for global or regional use of the data. And that is a natural question. Would it be available at the national level? Well, legally, it cannot. Technically, yes, it could be available. But we will require the you know, authorization of every country to post or, or present the data. And of course, some countries already announced open data policy, and that will be the case. But that process will be starting in the first quarter of, of 2017. We think it's a major change. And that's why I said this is uh, the last fra of its kind. You know, the, the, the 2021, the formal fra, will be, will be already, you know, with many previous publications and assessments and, and info offered to the public. And when it comes to life, will be a much more uh, two-way uh, publication that the, the, the old system used to be. Thank you very much for for listening and I'll be happy to answer that part of the of any question that I can answer. You know, I, I have limited knowledge on on the on the issue. Only to finish with this. Is everybody happy in FAO about these new possibilities? Of course not. Of course not. We are changing, you know long-term traditions and you know those of you that are foresters here you know that foresters love to go to the field and and do the the, the direct uh, you know uh, ground truthing and measurements and and now we will need to do less and less of those you know as we advance and we are clear that we are not uh, mixing a coffee plantation with a a planted uh, forests of teak or other possibility. But that, that, is, that will be solved in, in few months after several more observations. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, for me, the question would not be, is everybody happy in FAO? but is everybody happy in the countries and would they take ownership of uh, this type of information within their uh, respective institution? But that's something what we can discuss then in the panel uh, after the presentation. I would like now to, in, uh, to uh, introduce you to Tanji Guama from AGOS. Uh, he will speak about the national mapping efforts uh, in Gabon and will be as well supported by Christophe Sanier from uh, from CIOS. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Tongi Guillaume from uh, Gabon, from the Gabonese space uh, uh, agency, you know. So I'm pleased uh, to be here today to present you uh, some activities uh, of Gabon on forest, on mapping uh, forest. Um, I'm pleased to share the presentation with my friend, uh, Mr. Christophe Sanier. And um, I would like to thank especially the Open Space Agency to uh, make possible our cooperation between Christophe and us. So, uh, some information about Gabon. You know, Gabon is a small country with um, uh, a lot of forest. We have 88% uh, of forest, so we have um, a country 
covered by forest. So it is very important for us to, to learn how to monitor the forest. OK, so this slide is very important because, um, like everybody knows, um, in 2007 in Bali, uh, a lot of people say that uh, to monitor it, you know, the rainforest forest, forest, you have to work with um, satellite data. But as you can see, this is the Congo Basin Forest, the second most important forest uh, in the world. But we don't have any, you know, any uh, remote sensing antenna. So one of the first uh, thing that uh, we made in Gabon, you know, when, when the, the president come, uh, Ali Bongo Ndimba, is to implement an antenna, a big antenna, uh, to permit to all the country in a circle of coverage to use our satellite data. So our antenna um, has a coverage circle about uh, 2,000 uh, 800 kilometers. So we have uh, 17 countries in uh, totally, but uh, 23, you know, uh, partially cover. So uh, we have all the forest of uh, the Congo Basin. We have also a lot of forest uh, from uh, West Africa. And we have for the pear tree, we have all the Guinea Gulf covered by um, our antenna. So we are a public agency. We made um, a lot of things, but uh, more for the government. Uh, our first mission is to establish a national space, space infrastructure. And um, today we deliver um, a lot of space services to the government. And one of the services is to monitor the forest. And we developed the methodology with uh, Mr. Sanier from uh, the Seal Society. So this is some uh, picture about us. So this is our uh, remote sensing center. This is our antenna. This is one of uh, uh, people, uh, uh, um, a picture with uh, some people who work uh, at the center. This is uh, the equipment to receive uh, data. And um, today we uh, receive uh, a lot of uh, Landsat data because it's uh, free as everybody know it's free we work with um, a south africa company to make the the terminal to receive the data we also uh, want to acquire uh, sentinel data but we have to download you know with uh, some internet problems so it's more uh, complicated but we work with uh Knes to to see how it can be possible to, to have a, a, a direct reception to of Sentinel data in Gabon for all the country. So uh, we have a lot of uh, Landsat data and we work with Landsat uh, data more than other. So um, we have four priority uh, sectors. So the government asks us to follow uh, and to um, give services on uh, forests, on water, on, uh, on the littoral, because we have 800 uh, kilometers uh, on the coast, and uh, with the urban. So we, uh, we use all these satellites, so we, we can uh, ask uh, to Airbus, to, um, to the ESA, to... Uh, the Italian Space Agency for, uh, for RADA. So we work with all of uh, these people. So I will let uh, Christophe uh, present uh, you the methodology uh, with one of uh, our services that we use for one of the services to monitor the forest. Thank you, Tanji. Thank you, Tangi. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just follow by uh, going into more the sort of the uh, forestry um, application and uh, the idea behind this work was really to try and prepare the grounds for a national forest uh, monitoring system 
which was initially developed, as uh, Tongi mentioned, in the, uh, in the project sort of funded by, by, by ESA and coordinated by our colleagues at GAF, but uh, has now been sort of gradually transferred to, uh, uh, to our Gabonese colleagues. And I will say that now, you know, the 2015 update has been fully produced by, uh, by AGOS with uh, just uh, some technical support from us. So I'll, I'll move very quickly on, on this. I mean, just to say that initially we developed sort of a baseline for 90, 2000, 2010, using uh, Landsat primarily, uh, but other data sets, uh, more high resolution data sets for, uh, for the validation uh, of the work. I mean, one of our ideas in developing this methodology and is actually to have a very sort of uh, robust methodology, and particularly from a, a, from a statistical point of view, in, in order to be able to, uh, to assess the uncertainty of, of the estimates being produced uh, following IPCC uh, guidelines. So, uh, Tongi has already uh, mentioned this, so I will not, uh, I will not sort of... Uh, uh, develop it further, but just say that HOS is a relatively uh, uh, new agency and, and just in the space of five years to going from uh, virtually uh, uh, nothing on the ground to, to uh, an operational system is actually quite, uh, quite an achievement. So this is what the original sort of uh, maps that were produced. I mean, considering that uh, Gabon is the cloudiest uh, country on earth, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that was already quite an achievement, and that was only purely based on, on, on the archive data, but we needed actually several years of observation to be able to, to, to provide a complete map. So there was a knowledge transfer program which was actually made possible thanks to the sort of long-term investment in, in people that actually Gabon and AGOS uh, did by sending sort of uh, long-term uh, people and you know, young Gabonese sort of on long-term training. And we conducted during this, the course of 2015 a series of sort of uh, training and production workshops uh, which made it possible for sort of AGOS staff to actually uh, produce the maps. And that's the actual... I mean, they, we, we have to use sort of composites I mean, to, to, to deal with the, the heavy cloud cover, but I'm, I will not dwell on that. And that's the, the coverage of the imagery that was achieved for uh, 2015, and that's the actual map that was produced. And you see that there's been some, there's been some changes in the, in the way that the, uh, the, 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 the Gabon forests have, have changed, or... Uh, but uh, we'll come to that in a very short moment. But one of the things that we had in mind is to have this very robust sort of uh, uh, sample design uh, which was underpinning the uh, uh, uncertainty assessment of those maps. And first of all, we produced sort of uh, really accurate maps, but nevertheless, and that was all published, you know, it was all published in a, in a uh, high impact factor sort of remote sensing journals. And we did go a step further and produce sort of uncertainty estimates, but effectively uh, providing methodology which, which had not really been applied before for, uh, uh, for combining uh, remote sensing with uh, uh, forest mapping. And that was published and was actually included, uh, provided an input to the uh, uh, GFOI uh, methods and guidance documents. So just to say a few things about the Gabon forest, it covers about 23.5 million hectares, which is actually more than was initially thought. And there has been a sort of, uh, uh, there has been, a, the, the deforestation in Gabon is very, is very, is very small. It's very small compared to, to other countries. Even in the Congo Basin, it's, it's, it's still very small, and particularly in 2000, 2010, and it's recently been sort of on the, on the upside, mainly due to, uh, to uh, new uh, sort of economic development. And one of the other also things that we can see is there is a natural forest generation, which is actually quite substantial and represents about four to 5,000 hectares a year. So that's just showing the, the, the main sort of drivers of changes nowadays, aside from the uh, forest exploitation, which is not really deforestation, but it's more sort of degradation because there's no change in land use. And currently, you, you, there is, there is this sort of the agribusiness which is uh, developing new activities, and that can be seen for, from the satellite. 
And what this also is doing, I mean, this was just one of these sort of uh, reporting updates for 2015, but this highlights also the need for this uh, near real time monitoring, which is also made sort of possible by having the uh, local reception. I'm just showing you, so this is the, the 2015 map for an extract. This is the composite, which is created based on the reference data which is then processed, and this is the newly acquired image, which you see, I mean, even with this, uh, we, we will use that type of image, and this is a cloud mask, which is then produced, and then uh, processed to identify here in the sort of lighter patches, the newly sort of deforested areas. And all of this can be recorded in the database, uh, which is then, uh, which tracks the events uh, through time, and it can then be integrated uh, to update the future natural forest cover map, which will then, its, its, process, its production will be made much quicker. I mean, currently for the moment, with the, the uh, knowledge transfer program, and that was done over a period of six months, but we already saw sort of thinking about uh, improving the production, is, uh, notably through this kind of process. So I'll just finish very briefly uh, to say that the the forest cover mapping update is now fully operational and the, the knowledge transfer is effective. Now the, you know, the AGLS is capable of, of producing these maps um, uh, uh, totally themselves. The near real time methodology is in a pre-operational phase and that is mainly due to the pre-processing constraints of the input data and the fact that we have to process a lot of cloud and cloud shadow uh, uh, we, we need to do a lot of cloud and cloud shadow masking, which is not, which needs to be adjusted from the standard sort of cloud mask we get from the, uh, uh, the standard processing. So I would say that one of the key things that would actually uh, 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 improve the, uh, the local capacity is to have uh, adapted sort of uh, adequately sort of uh, pre-process your data or, or methods to, to, to provide sort of clean data where we can really isolate the useful pixels. However, I mean, this is the main constraint, but the fact that the, the, the forest in, 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 in Gabon is non-seasonal and there is, uh, uh, we, we have a limited sort of uh, dense time series, it is possible, it is relatively easy to track changes and relatively simple method for detecting forest disturbance uh, provide sort of similar results to more sophisticated approaches. So uh, that, that's what I mean. It goes, it doesn't necessarily need to have some a very sophisticated approach to actually do uh, something useful. And with the fact, you know, we've got now Landsat 8 sort of directly received and the fact you could uh, potentially uh, complement this with Sentinel-2, uh, I mean, the whole system developed even for Gabon is effectively compatible with an annual forest monitoring system. And I'll just thank you for listening. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you Tanguy and Christoph, uh, for this update on uh, the efforts in Gabon. And congratulations uh, to your national mapping uh, of 2015. I remember the former uh, UN focal point, uh, Etienne Massa, uh, five years ago when a side event said, we want to map our forest by ourselves and don't want to be told by somebody else what's going on in Gabon. Congratulations. I would like now to hand over to René Sivem. Uh, he is working uh, as the technical se uh, secretary for Red Plus at the Ministry of Environment in Cameroon. Yeah, thanks, Frank Martin. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Rene Siwe is my name. I'm uh, the technical coordinator of the Red Plus Technical Secretariat in Cameroon. So, um, as for those of you, uh, you might be aware already, Cameroon is an FCPF country. Um, the country has been, um, is actually at the stage of uh, producing, uh, elaborating its national Red Plus uh, strategy. So, uh, in phase one of the, pro uh, the process. But at the same time, the country has also been involved, uh, has had a uh, an emission reduction uh, pro project idea note elaborated and uh, accepted by the carbon fund so uh, the country is now part of the uh, carbon fund uh, process so um, the objective of my presentation this afternoon is actually to 
um, to illustrate with different data sets, national ones and global ones, how we are actually um, struggling to meet up with uh, the requirements of these uh, two phases of, uh, of the process, that is uh, the readiness phase and also uh, requirements for elaborating an emission reduction program. So um, I'll just uh, make a brief summary of uh, ongoing MRV uh, developments in which I'll talk about uh, the MRV action plan, what are the key steps that the country intends to take. Uh, these are actions that uh, fall within the readiness uh, phase of the process. Also institutional arrangements and discussions related to the forest definition and also uh, different thematic classes. Then I'll proceed with uh, presenting different uh, national uh, initiatives uh, with regards to uh, activity data and also emission factors and also how uh, we are trying to uh, in cases where the data sets are not available how we try to complement this with the uh, global data sets and some of the challenges that we are facing um, presenting also some perspectives and I'll, con um, I'll make some concluding statements also on uh, what I think uh, could be some uh, important take-home messages to actually help countries like Cameroon uh, in uh, actually realizing uh, the requirements of uh, the MRV. So, um, uh, with the help of FAO in 2012, Cameroon elaborated what they call an MRV action plan. So, key steps in that action plan was actually um, there is a component of the organizational structure trying to define uh, the functions of the system, uh, identify uh, institutions that could play a key role in the process and uh, attributing roles and responsibilities to these different in institutions and also uh, setting up different protocols on how these institutions have to interact with each other. Um, the next key component in that action plan was about the national circumstances. Um, here was about defining the scope of the MRV, um, elaborating key definitions for uh, uh, for forests, for deforestation, degradation, um, also the assessment of key categories. Uh, Cameroon intends to uh, has an approach in which it's looking at uh, so-called agroecological zones. So there are five in total. So um, this is uh, the idea. There is also to look into key categories in these different agroecological zones. Um, carry out an analysis of significant carbon pools and gases in the different agroecological zones, and also carry out an analysis of available data and information. The next uh, main component in the action plan was the elaboration of a forest uh, carbon monitoring concept. Uh, here, the idea was is actually to, uh, based on the new based on the definitions, to actually come up with a, a kind of a guidelines on how uh, forest mapping should be done in the country and what are the norms and uh, standards that have to be respected. Then uh, the integration of uh, um, also. Integrating a QC and QA plan, and lastly, um, not uh, lastly, is actually the accounting for non-carbon benefits, which is also um, something which Cameroon considers quite important in the process. Uh, so it's not only about the carbon, but also looking into uh, non-carbon uh, carbon benefits and ensuring also the integration of uh, uh, the local community in the MRV system. And last but not the least, uh, is uh, capacity building. So, um, sorry for the quality of the graphic, uh, but uh, discussions have already taken place with uh, actually identifying all the institutions that could play a key role in the uh, MRV uh, process. So, um, I'll just move directly to the next slide, which uh, have, uh, identifies the key institutions. So, there is the uh, Ecological and Monitoring Unit of the Ministry of Environment, which is expected to play a key role in the process, because it's uh, in this ministry, it is in this... Uh, Unit, this unit hosts actually the, uh, the UNFCC uh, focal point. There is a subdirectorate for forest inventory and management, which is also uh, going to be responsible for carrying out forest inventory. That is uh, identity, the emission factor component. The National Cartographic Institute will also play a key role in the activity data. So um, these institutions have are now been identified, and uh, there is a tentative uh, institutional arrangement that exists. The next step is actually now to formalize these uh, institutional arrangements. With regards to the forest definition, um, I just highlighted uh, the key uh, thresholds in the definition that have been adopted. So um, the minimum area is going to be 0 0.5 hectares, um, minimum crown cover 10%, and minimum tree height at maturity is uh, 3 meters. 
So um, the thematic classes, um, so this table just illustrates uh, the different, uh, here you find the classical, uh, the uh, IPCC classes. And the, these, the level one is what the country actually would love to see in its maps actually. So um, we, we hope that um, mapping initiatives would actually make an attempt to categorize especially split forests in these different forest types and also uh, uh, agricultural areas. So the objective would be to, to start with uh, the classes on level one and uh, based on uh, how we dis, uh, the understanding of the system improves, then we can move then in a later stage to, to level two. So coming now to the, uh, the data sets, national, uh, what is actually available at the moment? In regards to activity data, uh, we could, uh, the entire country was mapped by uh, a project OSFT and, uh, and the REDAF project. Eight administrative regions of the country has been mapped uh, for 1990, 2000, and 2010. And these were the main data sets that were used in, uh, in the emission reduction program that was submitted to the, to the carbon fund. So um, un unfortunately, we cannot really ex uh, have a clear estimate of the total forest area that comes from these national data sets because uh, as, you, as you realized in the previous slides, uh, two, a significant section of the country hasn't been mapped, uh, was not mapped during this initiative. So, uh, nonetheless, because we had a key discussion during the Carbon Fund meeting about whether Cameroon could be considered a high forest uh, country. So uh, these figures actually, uh, if we consider only the, the area that has been mapped yet, almost 50% of the, forest, the country can be, could be considered as forest, assuming that the remaining two regions that have not been mapped, even if there is no forest there. But comparing these figures now with, um, with the global data sets from, uh, from Hansen et al., um, what we did here was just to, uh, an illustration of what we obtained from the different, uh, using different thresholds. So using uh, the 10% threshold uh, from the global data set, our 88% of the countries uh, will be considered a forest. So, um, of course, uh, the forest cover decreases as we increase uh, the, the, the ground cover threshold. So um, this is an exercise which we also obtained from an exercise. Uh, this is uh, results that we obtained from an exercise that was carried out in collaboration with, uh, with GAF. What we did here was just to, we try to compare the results of uh, the national initiative with, with that of the global initiative. So this is actually a, the very, a very high resolution data. So um, you realize here at 10%, looking at the global data set, the, the entire area is, is classified as forest. When we change the thresholds, playing with the thresholds, you realize that it's only when we get to about 40 to 50 percent that we have, let's say, um, a situation which actually reflects uh, the reality. So this is just a slide, just to uh, just an illustration of um, the kind of challenges that we face on making decisions on which data sets to use actually when. Um, this is also um, another example of deforestation rates. Um, Cameroon is a classical case where, um, depending on what article you, or what uh, article you're reading, you have a different estimate of deforestation. Um, the, the, the rate that we obtained using the, uh, the national uh, data sets was around zero point, almost 0 0.3. Um, using the uh, global data set from Hansen et al. and playing also with the different, uh, with different uh, thresholds, the graph, the, you have a, uh, the situation which is illustrated by the different colors here below. In any case, you're, um, there is some level of discrepancy. Nonetheless, this info, the, uh, these two sets of information were, were quite helpful to also illustrate that Cameroon is a low, for a low deforestation country, regardless of what data set you're looking at. Um, so um, we, I mean, I'm, I'm showing most of these slides because uh, to actually accept Cameroon in, within the carbon fund as a um, high forest, low deforestation country was actually, uh, we needed to use all these different data sets to actually justify that position. So um, this is also an initiative which was carried out by, by GRC, also to map uh, deforestation. And the figures that we obtained here also corroborate the ones that we showed before from, uh, uh, from the global data set and also from the national data set. This, is more, this was more a sampling initiative 
And uh, the deforestation rate of, for Cameroon is actually illustrated here. So I'll skip this. In, case of, uh, in the case of emission factors, um, while when we were actually elaborating the emission reduction program, um, we didn't have access to, uh, because Cameroon had carried out a national forest inventory in 2005, but unfortunately, uh, we didn't have access to this data when we were preparing the emission reduction program. So we actually looked also into different global data sets to actually uh, calculate emission factors in, uh, in the area in question. So this table, um, you may want to ignore this, just don't, don't really struggle to read it, but just consider each of the, uh, each of the lines uh, in this column as uh, uh, different administrative departments in Cameroon. And uh, we kind of like, we had these uh, five different uh, global data sets that we were looking at and trying to look into uh, how the, uh, the emission factors that are reported from all these different figures. You, you could actually, you see the discrepancy that is there. Um, because, um, what we did in the emission reduction uh, program area, at, in any case, it was uh, a project idea. So we just used the uh, average figure from all these. In, in, any, in any case, uh, there are actually discussions. Uh, what we intend to do now as we go forward with regards to the emission reduction uh, program area is uh, we've now had access to the 2005 uh, inventory data. Um, uh, fortunately, um, FAO had already um, assessed biomass based on this data. And from information that the reports that we also received, the, uh, the biomass figures have, already, have also been revised using the Chave equation of 2014. So we are looking at this data now and thinking of, um, as we go forward in the process, how we could use this to actually update uh, uh, the emission, uh, emission factors for the, emission, for the uh, emission reduction program area. So um, what are the perspectives? Um, we, we think it's very important that we consolidate the national MRV guidelines to actually set clear standards on what exactly, uh, how we expect things to be done. Um, next, uh, we are also collaborating now with the University of Maryland and also with Silver Carbon to produce uh, updated maps for uh, 2000, 2010 and 2015. Um, this, uh, depending on the resources that are available, we, we, we may either have this done at a national scale or we'll focus only in the um, emission reduction uh, area. Um, we also receive support in the framework of the Geo for Africa program to uh, carry out training on uh, image interpretation. So we have uh, experts in the uh, uh, technical secretariat that benefit from these different tra trainings. Uh, we are also, um, we have uh, discussions also with OSFACO because OSFACO is more or less a continuation of the initiative that uh, produced the initial national uh, um, activity data pr uh, products that are existing. So uh, we are discussing also with them to check on the possibilities of actually completing the other two administrative regions. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, there are also discussions ongoing now, um, uh, mainly with the U.S. Forest Service, with the bank. We've also discussed with the FAO on the possibilities of actually uh, analyzing the 2005 NFA di NFI data and uh, making a new proposal on, uh, for a new NFI. Um, there is also a possibility here that we could also use these 2005 data sets to see how we could calibrate um, the, some of the global data sets. Um, uh, depending on whether um, the midterm report of Cameroon gets approved by the participants committee of FCPF, if we get any additional funds, we are also thinking about the possibility of actually carrying out a new, invent, um, a new national forest inventory. So um, we are looking forward also to participating in the MRV training of trainers workshop, uh, which is uh, scheduled for, for Abidjan in February 2017. So what are the concluding statements? What, uh, what I would consider as the lessons that we've learned as we go forward in the process. Uh, as you realize, there are actually numerous data sets with varying specifications and results. Um, this is not a favorable situation for countries like Cameroon where uh, I can't wear the level of understanding of the, uh, of the process in producing these data sets is not optimal. So, um, uh, and this leads to the, the next point, which I mentioned, uh, it's important to support countries in outlining national standards and norms to guide all the initiatives. Another um, key point is also, um, it's important for donors and service providers to improve coordination. 
Um, and lastly, it is very important to strengthen national capacity to allow users to make informed decisions about the utility of the different uh, data sets. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Rene. And I would like to uh, get the speakers here on the panel for uh, some uh, questions from the audience. So please, uh, question from the audience. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kwame. I'm from Ghana. Um, let me start by saying that it's been very, very um, good discussions. I've really learned a lot from all the experts who presented. Um, personally, I've also benefited from some of the GFI training. I was part of the Ethiopia workshop. And um, I see their guidelines as very helpful in developing national forest monitoring systems. But my question has to, I have two questions um, for the FAO and also for Martin. Um, for FAO, um, you've done tremendously well in um, sort of coming up with data on forests globally. My latest challenge has been that FAO tends to use a generic definition of forest for all countries to allow some form of comparability. But countries also have a leeway to come up with their own definition. So Cameroon have their definition, as, as was indicated in the presentation, 10% canopy cover. Ghana has a different definition of forest, and so does uh, many other countries. So using a generic definition to quantify global forests poses a challenge to individual countries. So I want to know how FAO, in moving forward with their new approach for forest monitoring, will take um, this on board, um, as to specifically the different, different definition that exists. In addition, I think eliminating um, ground truthing or national data from global forest assessment also poses some difficulties. Um, because um, in the keynote address, it was rightly said that you can easily map um, tree crops as forests, although the country may not define tree crops um, as forests. So I think that is also one issue that FAO needs to take on board in moving forward with the approach. Thank you for, for the question. Yeah. Um, lastly, to Martin, yeah. Um, <clears throat> if, it's a, if it's a short addition, yes, but. Uh, Please, no presentation. Okay. <laughs> All right, then I'll end here. Giacomo, please. Uh, thank you for uh, excellent presentation. Giacomo Grassi from Joint Transit Center of the European Commission. I have a question for Rene Castro. Uh, we heard many times uh, these days on the potential of forests to contribute to the Paris Agreement goals, which is certainly true. But to make it uh, materialize this, this potential, we need to increase confidence in numbers. One of the reasons of lack of confidence is, among others, uh, quite big discrepancy in some countries between what is reported to FAO and what is reported under the FCC. I mean, as a reviewer, when I found, again, as inventor, a national communication, which have data which are strikingly different between this UN agency, I let it know to the country. But the same message would, should arrive also from the FAO side. So the question is, is there any plan to reinforce and uh, to encourage country to verify that the data they report are consistent with the NFCC? Of course, differences may exist due to different forest definition or many other reasons. But often the difference that we observe go beyond, much beyond uh, the, the possible explainable difference. And often the main reason is simply that different agency are in charge of different reporting and they don't speak each other enough. Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Paula Durruti. I'm from Paraguay, South America. And I have a question for uh, Dr. Christopher Sanyar. Um, in the map of land cover of 2005, I see a uh, figures regeneration. Can you explain me about the process? Thank you. Maybe I think we'll leave the 
Okay, uh, related to foul, yes, uh, to the second question first. When I ask, is this a game changer? Methodology will be the same all over the world. That's a challenge. Many countries will not like that. We cannot legally offer the information of a particular country unless that country asks for it, but we can do it at the regional or global levels. And I guess that will allow experts, academicians, and people to start making better and better comparison and will put pressure on countries to accept that the data should be open. You know, the, the natural example is if you go now to any city, you check the meteorological and climate conditions in your iPhone. In the past, that was considered military, you know, uh, relevant information. Now it's to, to choose your, your attire. Uh, something like that is, is technical, technically possible, legally not yet. To the other question, uh, the definition of forest, we need to have one definition in the world in order to make it comparable. Of course, there are different types of forests, and of course there is pressure that we, that we should separate the natural forest from the planted forest and others. Uh, we receive letters to ask him exactly for that, and we are asking other relevant institutions, members of the Collaborative Partnership on Forests, 14 institutions that work on forestry, that maybe we should do a concerted effort to discuss these issues of what is the, the forest definition. Then, on the other side, we will not like to lose all the data series of 70 years that allows you to compare with the past of what is happening. So we will be carefully analyzing it. And yes, it is, 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 it is under our radar. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. And briefly. Uh, yes, just to, to answer the question on the natural regeneration. I mean, there's two, there's two main reasons for it. Is the logging roads which are abandoned once the forest is exploited as part of the uh, management program. And that there is natural forest regrowth after just even if uh, vegetation starts to grow even just after a few months and then the forest comes back as secondary forest and there is natural regeneration in the savanna area so that it's, it's a natural trend in central africa that when savannas when they're not burned every dry season uh, forests will naturally expand and we we can observe that uh, yeah from satellite well with this uh we have to end our side event. Thanks a lot for your active participation and uh, coming so uh, numerously uh, to listen what uh, we had to say with respect to global uh, uh, global data sets and national uh, forest monitoring system. Uh, one message which I got from the many presentations is capacity building is really needed in, and that is a long-term activity. And we cannot use global data sets uh, also because of different definitions, just on uh, off the shelf, we have to involve the nationals to, uh, to uh, take as well ownership of uh, these important uh, national data set over their forest. Thanks a lot for coming and uh, wish you uh, successful continuation within the COP. And maybe see some of you tomorrow at the uh, uh, side event at the European uh, Pavilion. Within the next
They will be on the UNFP to be I think tomorrow. Do you have a uh, main text for the next Ghana? No? Ah. Okay. So.